Kumara, please start. Yes, ma'am. A very pleasant, a very pleasant and cheerful welcome to one and all present here, all the respected learned delegates, eminent scholars, literary enthusiasts, and distinguished participants, aspirant learners of literature who have joined us live here for the seven-day long national level certificate course in Shakespearean studies round the country. Your presence makes us very happy. I, Dr. Humera Qureshi, feel the privilege to be here today on the inaugural ceremony of the seven-day long national level certificate course in Shakespearean studies. A course in Shakespearean studies typically involves an in-depth exploration in the life, works, and cultural impact of William Shakespeare, one of the most renowned playwrights and poets in the history. The present course offers the opportunity to engage deeply with the work of one of the history's greatest writers, while also exploring broader themes related to literature, history, performance, and cultural studies. It provides a rich and a multifaceted understanding of Shakespearean's legacy and significance in literary canon. So, dear aspirants, welcome to the national level certificate course in Shakespearean studies under the umbrella of Shakespearean Society of Central India in collaboration with the Department of English of Kaval Rama of Rajkumar Kaval Ramani Kanya Mahavidyalaya Nagpur. Hislop College, Nagpur, J.M. Patel Arts, Commerce and Science College, Bhandara, R.S. Mundli, Dharampet, Arts and Commerce College, Nagpur, to celebrate William Shakespeare's birth anniversary through this online national level certificate course in Shakespearean studies. At the onset, Can you please ask others to mute. Uh, I request all my dear participants to kindly mute themselves so as to maintain the decorum of this platform. Kindly mute yourself. Thank you so much. So at the onset, a huge bunch of congratulations to the team of this event to bring together the eminent fraternities from all over the country to share their views and opinions about the different facets of Shakespearean studies. Before we proceed further towards this uh, discourse, I request my distinguished participants present here on this virtual platform to please join me to start today's program by giving our guest speaker the most cordial of welcome, Dr. Sabir Dhar, Dean, School of Humanities, ex-officiating Vice-Chancellor, Rabindra Bharti University, Kolkata. On behalf of all gathered here, I accord a hearty welcome to you, sir. With warm regards, I extend my heartfelt welcome to Dr. Pranati Chakrabartima, President, Shakespeare Society of Central India, Dr. Usha Sakure, Ma'am, Secretary, Shakespeare Society of Central India, and all the eminent dignitaries of the English fraternities. I heartily welcome you all on this most awaited knowledge enhancing event. The success of today's event directly and indirectly goes to all the eminent delegates and participants who have shown their interest, willingness, and with their overwhelming response, joined us here live. I welcome all the participants from the varied universities around the nation for being live with us. I am truly delighted with your presence. So welcome one and all. And I assure the seven day long national level certificate course in Shakespearean studies will be very productive and worth your precious time. So before we take up right in the air of today's topic, let me take an opportunity to introduce the most pleasant and dynamic as uh, astonishing personality, Dr. Pranati Chakrabarti Ma, President, CLIC and Shakespeare Society of Central India, uh, from the day of its inception. The list of her credentials are, uh, are as far as Chakrabarti Ma'am is concerned, is totally endless. She is a versatile, she is a versatile pers uh, personality uh, where she has huge writings, compositions, uh, she has a talent of singing, and the list is totally endless. Without uh, respected ma'am's effort and initiative, 
Shakespearean society in central India would not have shaped the way it is today. Internationally studied, internationally recognized poet, it is a proud and privilege to have her as a philosopher and guide. I request dear participants, kindly mute yourself. Thank you so much. With respect, I invite Dr. Pranoti Chakrabarti ma'am to bestow her valuable introductory remarks. The, the entire platform is all yours, ma'am. Over to Dr. Pranoti Chakrabarti ma'am. I request all my dear participants to kindly mute yourselves. Over to Dr. Pranoti Chakrabarti, ma'am. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Uh, good morning, all participants, coordinators of the participating colleges, and the, college that, the colleges who are participating today are the Rajkumar uh, Keval Ramani College, Nagpur, Hislop College, Nagpur, J.M. Pat Patel College, Bandara, R.S. Mundle, Dharampet College of Arts and Commerce, Nagpur. And I also um, welcome our secretary, Dr. Usha Sakure, our com compare of today's program, Dr. Humera, Humera Kureshi. And I welcome all of you today to this online Shakespeare certificate course being organized to celebrate Shakespeare's birth anniversary in 2004. 500 years have passed, but the bard is still relevant today. As Thomas Carly pointed out, I quote, Shakespeare and Dante are saints of poetry. They dwell apart in a kind of solitude, none equal, none second to them in the general feeling of the world. Today, in this inaugural session, we have with us the renowned Shakespeare scholar, Dr. Shubir Dhar from Rabindra Bharati University, Kolkata, who will speak. Uh, he had earlier given his topic, uh, Shakespeare's relevance in, in India and his influence on the English language and literature. But we will leave it open to him and ask him to speak on whatever he's free to talk. He is too learned, so we will be only too ha happy to hear him. I also would like to say a few words about this course. It is, we, <laughs> it takes a lot of labor to organize such an event and to get well-versed resource persons to willingly share their knowledge and experience. Similarly, I thank all our resource persons who are all respected Shakespeare scholars for agreeing to share their scholarship with our participants throughout the week. This is a unique course and nowhere in India and abroad within my limited knowledge such a certificate course is available. I congratulate the colleges who have come forward to share the platform with SSCI in this unique endeavor. A large number of undergraduate and postgraduate students have joined for this course, and we hope they will be benefited from this certificate course. Questions have been raised regarding the relevance of Shakespeare today, we in India have always admired great men, writers, philosophers, and spiritual leaders. We look up to genius and adopt and adapt at will. Even in this post-colonial era, Shakespeare shines as a beacon of light for our students and academicians. This is because Shakespeare is, above all, a poet of nature. His works hold up a mirror to the manners and intricacies of life and living in this world. 
Shakespeare's appeal is universal and immortal. This is due to the humanism that pervades his plays and perpetuates human values. In his tragedies, Shakespeare is concerned with the ruins and restorations of the soul and the life of man. According to Professor Dowden, the subject of Shakespeare's plays is the struggle of good and evil in the world. Yet Shakespeare was no un unworldly philosopher. His plays are rooted in reality. He could easily portray the agonies, the misgivings, the questionings, the torments that dodge humanity. Macbeth's traumas, fueled by his inordinate ambition, are mirrored on one hand, and Lady Macbeth, unfailing desire to see her husband crowned king, coupled with her sense of guilt at her own premonitions, are unparalleled in dramatic history. Shakespeare's tragedies do not follow the classical rules of tragedy. You know, in Greek tragedy, they had very strict rules, only sorrow and suffering for the tragedy, and only gaiety for the comedy. Shakespeare's plays are an admixture of both sorrow and happiness, and thus they are called romantic dramas. Romantic, not in the sense of romance, but because the plays reveal an admixture of joy and sorrow. Thus it is said, Shakespeare approximates the remote and familiarizes the wonderful. His characters act and speak by the influence of general passions and principles by which all minds are agitated and the whole gamut of life is in continuous motion. In the Globe Theatre, Shakespeare gave the audience what they liked and thus did not follow any superimposed rules. Ben Johnson, on the other hand, tried to tell the audience what they should like. But yet Ben Johnson's comment about Shakespeare, I quote, he is not of an age, but for all times, this comment of Ben Johnson has never been surpassed. Now, Five hundred years have passed, but the bard is still relevant today. As Carlyle said, Shakespeare and Dante are saints of poetry. They dwell apart in a kind of solitude, none equal, none second to them in the general feeling of the world. Today, I, I would like to say that this certificate course has been planned to give a holistic view of Shakespeare's dramatic writings to undergraduate and postgraduate students of English literature. Being an online course, our aim was to extend the boundaries of knowledge so that our expert resource persons could share their views with a greater number of students and be directly accessible to them. Over the years, language has evolved in a significant manner. Spelling has not, spelling had been, had not become standardized by sh sh in Shakespeare's time. And that meant that many words could take a variety of forms. This was done by James Joyce and his innovative prose and verse writers of the 20th century. Shakespeare reveled largely in the freedom of a uh, largely unanchored un language provided. In many instances, Renaissance English had a single spelling for what we now define as two separate words. For example, the word humane combined the sense of human and humane. Lady Macbeth says, my husband has the milk of humane kindness. Now, this word humane, does it mean human kindness belonging to our species or was it humane? So, these 
this type of double meaning were there in the language and he then uh, Shakespeare made uh, use of them. Likewise, the word bad or bade, born and b-o-r-n-e, born, died and died. To move on to the 20th century criticism, we find Professor A.C. Bradley as the most imposing figure. Professor Bradley considers that character is destiny in Shakespeare. He believes that characters are themselves responsible for their doom. But other critics like Wilson Knight point out that there is an overemphasis on character during drawing in Shakespeare. In this certificate course, a overview of Shakespeare's writings will be presented to our students. We are, however, planning a more detailed follow-up in the July-August semester for Shakespeare lovers. Shakespeare also means songs, music, comedy, laughter, love, and magic. He is not always serious. And as Professor Anil Matthew of Islam College told me, he said, Pranodhi, we are too serious about Shakespeare. Why not enjoy the lighter side also, the music, the comedy? And in the Twelfth Night, the Duke see, says, it's muse, if music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. That's a feeding. The appetite may sicken and so die. O spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou. And I will end with a quote from Ben Johnson again. Thou art a monument without the truth. So thank you. And I wish that you will enjoy your session with Dr. Dor. I hand over to Dr. Kuresh. Thank you so much, madam. Your thought-provoking introductory address set a perfect platform for our distinguished participants to sail in the Shakespearean's work in the ocean of English literature. Thank you once again, ma'am, from the bottom of my heart. Now, I, it's my pleasure. It's all my pleasure, ma'am, to hear you. So thank you so much. With a lot of pride and pleasure again, I would like to invite now Dr. Prashant Shilgitsa, Principal Islip College, a very dynamic leader who has taken the college to the great heights. Over to Dr. Prashant Shilgitsa. So we would like you to share your yeah. words. With yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed delegates and distinguished speakers, it is with great, great pleasure and enthusiasm that I welcome you all to this year's Shakespeare certificate course hosted by Islop College Nagpur. This course is a testament to our commitment to four. We are not just celebrating the genius of playwright, but also exploring the profound impact of his work continue to have on literature, culture and society. I am confident that this course will offer invaluable insights, enriching discussions and a unique opportunity to delve into the world of Shakespearean literature in depth. Our esteemed speakers, experts in the field, have graciously agreed to share their knowledge and expertise with us. Their contribution will undoubtedly make this course a memorable and enlightening experience for all. I encourage each one of you to actively participate, ask questions, and engage in thoughtful dialogue throughout the course. May this journey into the world of Shakespeare inspire and ignite a passion for literature that will stay with you long after the course concludes. Once again, welcome to our Shakespeare Certificate course. Let us embark on this enlightening journey together. 
thank you thank you very much and all the best thank you so much sir for your enlightening words it truly matters a lot to us so i once again thank you now let us move ahead it takes a lot of words to say what we have in minds dr subir dhar sir has tons of wisdom which he will share with us okay. now let me take an opportunity and it's a great pleasure to listen to this eminent uh, speaker's address for this uh, we are like highly privileged to have with us uh, a great academician a diligent personality par excellence dr subir dhar sir who has served as a dean of school of humanities director school of international languages at sister nivedita university in kolkata additionally he offers guidance and mentorship to the department of english with a rich academic background dr dhar has also held significant positions such as officiating vice chancellor at rabindra bharti university and director of university school of languages and culture he has further contributed as the director of the tagore gandhi center and as a professor in english today on this pleasant morning we are privileged to have the opportunity to listen to him on the topic shakespeare in india his influence in english language and literature so without any further delay with great pride and honor i would like to invite respected dr subir dhar sir to cast light on his office knowledge upon us so over to dr subir dhar sir sir please unmute yourself i request please unmute yourself you, sir, yes uh, i like I to begin by thanking you dr kureshi for these very kind words and uh, i would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me this morning to deliver my talk on shakespeare uh, a small correction i'm not going to talk about really you know shakespeare in india and uh, influence on literature language and so on so uh that was a preliminary thought that we had in an initial discussion today what i want to talk about is once again something very fundamental to our perception of shakespeare and when i say our i mean we are indians reading shakespeare doing shakespeare for so many hundreds of years so you see we have a long tradition of our own and i really want to take up one of the most seminal one of the most accessible plays of william shakespeare a play that even most of your undergraduate students have read or at least have heard about a play called macbeth so i shall be talking about macbeth but i won't be talking for about macbeth from the traditional point of view you know characterization and uh, uh, theme and plot and so and so i want to give a kind of a if you want a twist to the whole notion of what this play is about in a sense i'm going to talk about macbeth as a political play and i should be looking at the concept of violence and the legitimacy of violence of power and kingship and statehood in this play by william shakespeare so this is what i'm going to talk about now uh, let me start by saying uh, since one of the greatest shakespeare scholars in india was sri aurobindo and i want to begin by giving a couple of quotations from aurobindo and aurobindo's vision or perception of shakespeare now the first one both of them are from uh, sri aurobindo's uh, very important work the future poetry and uh, let me quickly look at the first quotation and then i'll come to the second one in the first quotation sri aurobindo is writing shakespeare is uh, shakespeare's is not a drama of mere external action this is not virat the seer and the creator of uh, gross forms but hiranugorgo the luminous mind of dreams and then he continues more than any other poet shakespeare has accomplished mentally the legendary feat of the impetuous sage bishma bishmitra uh, 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 his power of vision has created 
a Shakespearean world of its own. And uh, uh, after this, basically he's comparing Shakespeare is talking about, in fact, I don't have any presentation, but I shall, you know, talk and uh, uh, this won't be any chalk, but I will certainly, you know, repeat the quotations if you want. Right. So you see, Sri Aurobindo is saying that Shakespeare is not Virat, not the materialist, but rather Hiranugarbho, that is, you see, the seer and the creator of, uh, seer, seer and the creator. He's a luminous mind of, of dreams. And then he continues that uh, Shakespeare is like Vishwamitra with his power of vision, having created a world of its own. Now, this is one quotation, which obviously shows how we Indians reacted to the genius of William Shakespeare. The second quotation also from the future poetry, about 150 pages after the first one, uh, Sri Aurobindo's writing, uh, 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 he's saying that there's a difference between the spirit of Elizabethan poetry and uh, the poetry of India. What does he say? He says, the, and I quote, work of the life spirit in a new, raw and vigorous people, not yet tamed by a restraining and formative culture. So he says that the Elizabethan Christian. Culture, Christian. the work of a uh, the work of the life spirit of a new, raw and vigorous people, not yet tamed by a restraining and formative culture. This was one. Against that, he talks about the poetry of the classical Sanskrit writers, which he says was the work of Asiatic minds, scholars, court poets in, a, in an age of immense intellectual development and an excessive, almost over-cultivated refinement. In other words, you see, he's distinguishing between the European mind of the Renaissance and the Indian classical mind of our own Sanskritic tradition. And he's saying one is, the Indian mind, for example, is one of immense intellectual development and an almost excessive uh, over-cultivated refinement. Contrasted with that is the Elizabethan mindset, which is, the, a spirit which is new, raw, and uh, not yet tamed by the restraining and formative culture. Now, in other words, you see, so the distinction that he's drawing between the Indian literary heritage and the Elizabethan Shakespearean literature and culture. At the same time, after saying this, he says, uh, there is an, and I quote, an extraordinarily basic kinship between these two vividly separated ages of poetry. A kinship arising from the likeness of essential motive and psychological basic type and energies. So after seeing that you see the Indian spirit is different from the Shakespearean spirit, he says yet there is a kind of a kinship, a basic similarity a kinship or a similarity between <coughs> the uh, 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 a likeness of essential motive and psychological basic type and energies. Now, I take my cue from this. Following upon Sri Aurobindo, I am going to say that one should read Shakespeare not only from the Western perspective, which is something that we all do over the years, but also maybe from an Indian perspective. That is, I'm going to try and look at this play that, I'm, that I've taken up for discussion today, the play called Macbeth. I want to see this not from the perspective of Western scholars only, but also from the perspective of our own Indian traditional traditions of thought. Which is why you see, I'm going to swivel, oscillate between, say, Western thinkers People like, say, Michel Foucault, Max Weber, Ernst Kantorowicz, and similar European theorists. And I'm also going to look at uh, the concepts that are there, present, uh, theorized by Kautilu, Manu, and the Puranas, and even the Jujur Veda. So you see, this is what I'm going to try and look, do today. Looking at Macbeth, not from the perspective of the Western cultural theorists alone, because, you know, uh, in a sense, we have, we know the Western theorists. And obviously, 
after our knowledge of the Western theorists, we generally use it. But I'm trying to make a bridge, a bridge between our own Indian attitude, responses, theorizations, as well as the Western ways of looking at Shakespeare. That is what I'm going to try and try to do in a nutshell. But let me come to more basic things. What exactly am I wanting to look at in this text, Macbeth? Now, you've all read it, I'm sure. Or even if you haven't read it, you have, you've certainly heard about it, you certainly know about it, or at least you must have watched Macbeth. Now, this is a play which, to my mind, is a play about power and politics and the play of power in politics. And this is how I want to begin looking at this text. Now, uh, to begin with, there are certain scenes in the play which I think are rather interesting. For example, you see, the first, this is something that we all know, that is, you know, Macbeth is a very violent play. You know, there are dozens and dozens of episodes of violence which are either reflected uh, graphically on stage in this play or reported off stage. For example, you see, uh, there obviously is the scene of the murder of Duncan. Once again, we don't we don't see it on stage, <coughs> but we learn of it through the dialogues. But there's one scene that very few people look at, and that is, you see, the scene which is called the bleeding captain scene. What is this scene all about? Well, if you look at it, the scene is that there is a soldier who comes from the battlefield, fresh from the battlefield. He's got wounds all over his body and he comes and reports, tells King Duncan and the other courtiers about the bravery of Macbeth. What does he say? What he says is something very significant. What he says is, I'll just read this line section a bit. What he says is, yes, one sec please. Yeah. This is Act 1, Scene 2. Yes. Uh, the captain is talking about how the fate of the battle uh, was fluctuating, that at one point the opponents of the king were becoming uh, 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 were victorious, on the point of being victorious, and then he says uh, something very significant. He says that Macbeth was the man who was responsible for the killing of one of the rebels and uh, uh, Macdonald, and this is what he says. He says, uh, for brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands, nor bade, fa ba ba bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Now, look at these lines over here once again. Now, first of all, he says that Macbeth, Brave Macbeth, he calls him, with his brandished steel, the steel is of course a sword, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage. Now look at this. The steel, the sword of Macbeth is red with blood. It's smoked with bloody execution. And he says that Macbeth carved out his passage till he faced the slave. In other words, you see, Macbeth's progress on the battlefield is not a walk through a playground. Rather, Macbeth's progress to the battlefield is a bloody encounter. He literally slaughters soldiers left, right in front of him till he reaches the traitor Macdonald. And then he says, uh, till he faced the slave, which never shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon a battlements. Now, there are two instances of graphic violence over here. The first is that Macbeth is splitting 
with his sword the traitor in two for example till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops the nave is of course the navel and the chops are the lips so you see there's a graphic instance of a man literally being cut into two by macbeth and then till he fixed his head upon the battlements once again the beheading of the rebel soldier and the displaying of the head on the battlements of the castle now these are all violent scenes aren't they and they actually underscore some of the most violent incidents that would be found in this play now so you see this is the first incident of violence that we that we get is this the only one certainly not because later on as you know there are so many incidents of violence macbeth murdering duncan macbeth instrumental in murdering banco macbeth instrumental in the murder of uh, 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 macduff's wife and children and so you see this is one long litany of violence which litters the play the pages of the play macbeth one after the other there are so many incidents of violence but immediately after the scene comes the scene in which uh, king duncan has sentenced the thane of cawdor that is you see the thane who had rebelled against duncan he has sentenced him to death and there is a passage here which is once again very typical of the violence that was being done what is it said it said this is act 1 scene 4 Duncan says is the execution done on corder are not those in commission yet returned so is the execution done on corder so once again you see an execution an execution once again is an act of violence and this is duncan who is saying this and malcolm replies and says my liege they are not yet come back but have spoke with one that saw him die who did report that very frankly he confessed his uh, his treasons implored your highness's pardon set forth a deep repentance in other words you see an execution now executions are also don't forget acts of violence but the point that i want to make first of all is that you see if you look at what malcolm says uh, that the thane of corda the former thane of corda because later on macbeth is going to get the title thane of corda so the former thane of corda uh, very frankly he confessed his treasons implored your highness's pardon and set forth a deep repentance now he confessed his treasons what is this business of the confession and what is shakespeare intending by that to understand this we can turn to michel foucault and his book the history of sexuality volume 1 this is what foucault has to say and i quote the confession is a ritual of discourse in which the speaking subject is also the subject of the statement it is also a ritual that unfolds within a power relationship for one does not confess with the presence a virtual presence of the authority who requires the confession prescribes and appreciates it and intervenes in order to judge punish forgive console and reconcile a ritual in which the truth is corroborated by the obstacles and resistances it had to surmount in order to be formulated and finally a ritual which produces intrinsic modifications in the person who articulates it exonerates redeems and purifies him unburdens him of his wrongs liberates him and promises him salvation now let me explain this uh, this is foucault and naturally students here may find it difficult to follow so let me quickly you know paraphrase this what foucault is talking about are several things number one you see any confession is a ritual a ritual that unfolds within what foucault calls a power relationship why because you see when someone confesses he is confessing to someone who is more powerful isn't it and obviously the confessor and the person who is hearing the confess confession these are people who are implicated who are joined in a power relationship for example you see there is the authority of the person who requires the confession and 
this authority is supreme because this authority has the power to either judge or to punish or to forgive or to console and reconcile the person who is, who is confessing. In other words, you see, a confession is a kind of a public declaration, isn't it? And it is this that I want to concentrate on. The Thiel of Cordor, who was being put to death, confessed his treason. In other words, by confessing his treason, as you see, he is, number one, acknowledging the superiority of King Duncan, number two, recognizing his own guilt, and number three, also indicating the justness of the cause of Duncan. In other words, you see, the point that I'm trying to make is simple. You see, we have seen two acts of violence till now. The first one, Macbeth killing MacDonald, the traitor to the cause of the King Duncan. And second, Duncan's command that uh, 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 the Thane of Corder, the former Thane of Corder, is going to be punished by execution. Now, these are acts of violence which are scripted, which are, you know, displayed out in the open. Okay, why? Because you see, the killing of the battlefield, the killing on the battlefield, is recorded, remembered, reported by the bleeding captain. In other words, it's not a private act of violence. It is rather a public act of violence. Public in the sense that there are people who are witnessing this violence. Similarly, you see, the killing or the, or, or the execution of the former Thane of Corder, once again, this is a public execution. People are watching it, people are reporting about it, people are informing the king about what, take, what had taken place. In other words, you see, all these acts of violence are actually acts of violence that are, as I said, in the public eye. These are open acts of violence. Now, this is what I think is central to display Macbeth. What is that? You see, there are two kinds of acts of violences in Macbeth. The first uh, uh, kinds of violence that I was talking about are these public acts of violence. The killing of a traitor in the battlefield, the killing of uh, uh, soldiers on the opposite side by Macbeth, by Macbeth and, as I said, the, the, the killing, the execution of the former Thane of Corder. Right? Now, so these are open public displays of power. What is so important about that? What is important about that, you see, that this act of public violence, this open violence that is being manifested in the play, this is important. Why? Because it is actually underscoring, emphasizing the power of the legitimate authority. You see, it's like this. Max Weber, <coughs> the, psycho the, 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 the sociologist, said something very significant. He said, the state holds a monopoly on the display of violence. The state holds a monopoly on the display of violence. In other words, you see, it's very simply like this. I mean, if you go out today and you kill somebody, you will be arrested, you will be tried, tried and possibly you will be given the death sentence. On the other hand, if the state, if the judiciary, if the government decrees a death sentence on somebody, nobody is held responsible. To put it simply, you see, an act of violence which is personal is supposed to be illegitimate. On the other hand, a state-sanctioned act of violence is legitimate. For example, if you think back to, say, the Bush era in America, or even Barack Obama's age, once again, there were two assassinations which were carried out. First of all, that of Saddam, Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein, and second, of uh, 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 the, 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 the head of the terrorists, the Al-Qaeda uh, 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 Al movement. Now, in both these cases, you see, two people had been executed. And yet, you see, 
these were accepted as legitimate acts of violence. Why? Because they had been carried out by governmental authority, by governmental decree. On the other hand, the killing by one person of another person without this state sanction, this is deemed to be illegal and this is deemed to be sufficient for punishment by the state, by the judiciary, by the police and so on. So, in other, words, in other words, you see two kinds of violence. State violence, which is legitimate, and state violence is, of course, execution. The execution of the chain of order. State violence is also Macbeth the general killing the rebel soldier MacDonald. Isn't it? So state violence on the other one hand, and on the other hand, the individual private violences, which are illegitimate. Now, what about Macbeth? Well, if you remember, these are Macbeth's words, Act 3, Scene 1, <coughs> in which Macbeth is talking about Banco. And what does he say? He says, uh, this is Macbeth talking about Banco. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked. As it is said, Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sister when they first put the name of king upon me. Upon my head, they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlenient hand. No son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banco's issue have I filled my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan I have murdered, put rancors in the vessel of my peace. Now, once again, you see, what is Macbeth talking about? This is Macbeth reflecting on what he's going to do to Duncan. And he is going to kill Duncan. So once again, an act of violence. But I think, you see, more important than this act of violence, there are two other instances of violence earlier on in the play, which I briefly want to look at. The first is, of course, the killing of Duncan by Macbeth. Once again, what kind of a what kind of an act of violence is that? Is that a is that a public act of violence? It isn't. It's done in the middle of the night when darkness is all around. It is done in total secrecy because the only two people who know about this deed is of course Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And Duncan kills the legitimate king. So an act of violence which is done not publicly, not openly, but in concealment, in darkness. That's one. The other one, immediately after the murder of Duncan, are the other two murders that Macbeth commits. What are they? Macbeth, don't forget, kills the two grooms, the two servants who were there in the room of King Duncan when he was sleeping. No, of course, he justifies and he says that, you know, uh, how could I be rational? How could I be normal when I saw that these two men whose faces were reddened with Duncan's blood? And so presumably they had killed Duncan. So he says, I obviously killed them. But once again, you see, these are two other murders that Duncan does. And these two murders, the killing of Duncan and the killing of the grooms, the series of murders is only the first of a long series of murders that Macbeth commits. In fact, if you think of it, Macbeth is a serial murderer. Isn't it? One murder after another, after another, after another. This is the history of Macbeth as a man, as a person. Now, the point I am trying to make is simple. The point I'm making is that there are two kinds of violence in this play. Number one, as I said, open violence, which is done in the open daylight, which, is all, which has got the legitimacy of political power behind it. And then on the other, the secret acts of violence, murder, killing, destruction that Macbeth indulges in. The first one of which had been the killing of Duncan, the second, the killing of the two grooms. But as I said, these are not the only ones. Because later on, Macbeth is going on to the killing of uh, Ben. And later on even, 
the killing of Macduff's wife and his small children, all of them. <coughs> so you see, there's a series of killings, a series of murders that Macbeth is responsible for. And notice all of these are carried out in total secrecy, most of them in the darkness of night. So you see, there are two kinds of violent activities that this play Macbeth is actually representing, isn't it? Now, which really brings me to the point that I want to stress. That is, you see, uh, 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 yes, uh, the deeds of open and public violence, you know, like for example, the ones uh, uh, decreed by King Duncan, do not simply re-establish justice, but they reactivate the legitimacy of the state power. Okay. In other words, you see, when a king sentences someone to death and the sentence is carried out, what happens is that it is not only, you know, justice that is being established, but rather, you see, they actually reactivate the legitimacy of the state power the legitimacy of state power. That is, you see, the whole idea is that when a king gives a command for execution and when that command is being executed, is carried out, then you see the power of the king actually increases because people are reminded of the legitimate power of the king. So you see, state executions are never, ever individual destructions. State executions which entail the annihilation of one individual or several individuals actually reflect on the power and the glory of the state. And in Macbeth, you see, uh, you really find a similar kind of a manifestation. Because you see, Macbeth's deeds of violence, Macbeth's, that is, as an individual, deeds of violence are committed in secrecy and usually under the cover of darkness. And they are actually transgressions and travesties, parodies, if you want, of the legitimacy and openness of state power. Okay? So, you see, what is really point, interesting to notice is that Macbeth's acts of violence do not legitimize state power at all. They do not show that the state is all-powerful. They are secret acts of violence which are aligned with the personal interest of Macbeth alone. Now, at this point, let me bring in the theorization of a very important historian, a man called Ernst Kantorowicz. Kantorowicz was a German historian and he wrote a very important book back in the 1950s 1957 as a matter of fact a book which is called the king's two bodies now this is a very central text which i think is important to understand uh, this play macbeth what does kantorowicz talk about kantorowicz theorizes that there are two bodies of the king what are the two bodies of the king there is a physical body of the king the flesh and blood body of the king, if you want. And secondly, there is the metaphorical body of the king, which is state power, which is the body politic. So you see, Kantorowicz is saying that there are two bodies, the physical body of the king and the power of the king, which is actually the power of authority, the status of kingship. So there are two bodies of the king. Now, my point and this is something that I'll try to establish, is that Macbeth as an individual never actually becomes king. In fact, if you think of it, look at the title of the play. Is it King Macbeth? Certainly not. But look at all the other plays that Shakespeare wrote with king before them. For example, King Richard III, King Richard II, King Henry IV, King Henry V, King Henry VI, and so and so. Isn't it? Now, Macbeth is an exception. King Lear, for example. Macbeth is an exception. Why? 
because Macbeth doesn't have the word king before him. It is simply Macbeth. Now, I think there's a message that Shakespeare is wanting to indicate there. And the point is, Macbeth never becomes a real king. He is a king, but only in name. That is, you see, Macbeth does not or fails to reconcile or to fuse the two bodies of the king. What do I mean by that? What I mean to say is that the personal always remains the locus, the center of his concern. And here is what Macbeth is really talking about. You know, I would say that one of the real aspects of Macbeth's tragedy is his failure to uh, ascend or to attain the status of a king, even as he gains the territorial rights over the estate of Scotland. Let me explain this a bit. You see, the word status. Status means a position. Status also comes from state or status. That is, you see, the state represents a status. And the point, what I'm trying to say is that in Macbeth, you see, Macbeth fails to really become a king because when a person becomes a king, he has to fuse the two bodies of the king. That is, the physical body of the king must be transcended and unified with the greater entity that is the king not as a person but the king as a personality the king as a representative of the state that is you see the whole idea is that Macbeth is an abject failure to become a real king why you see throughout the play whenever Macbeth is talking notice Macbeth usually talks about himself, not so much about the kingdom, not so much about Scotland. Over and over again, he talks about his own feelings, his own perceptions, his own ambitions, his own achievements, his own future, and so on and so. That is, you see, the point is that Macbeth never quite really become the king because he fails to fuse the two bodies of the king, right? Now, in fact, you see, if you look at the uh, passage that I read out earlier, Macbeth like uh, thinking about Duncan as thinking about Banco, okay, uh, the lines once again, there is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said, Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when they first put the name of king upon me. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip. Thence to be wrenched with an undelian hand, no sign of mine succeeding. If it be so for Banco's issue, have I filled my mind? For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered? Put rancors in the vessel of my keys. Look at the look at the list, the series of personal pronouns. Okay, for example, whose being I do fear I. My genius, my my genius is to be my. Then when they first put the name of king upon me, upon my head they placed a fruitless crown, put a barren scepter in my grip, and then no son of mine succeeding. Uh, for Banco's issue, have I filled my mind? For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered? Put rancors in the vessel of my peace. So you see, uh, uh, in about 10, 12 lines of dialogues, there are at least eight or 10 references to the personal pronoun, I, my, mine. This is indicating that Macbeth can never think beyond himself. You see, that is the real requisite of a good, of a true king. A true king never thinks of himself. A true king always thinks of his kingdom. Kingdom being not only the, 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 the possession of his territory, the kingdom also means the people who live, who live, who, 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 who have a being inside the kingdom. This is something that Macbeth can never think of. Throughout the play, you see, 
he is completely totally self centered he cannot think beyond himself he cannot think of the state scotland that he has become the head of okay and this is the point i would like to make you see what i'm indicating or what i'm what i'm trying to show is that macbeth is a person in whom violence is something that is entirely personal you see even when he uh 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 uh, 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 uh dictates an execution <coughs> even that <coughs> is carried out like for example the killing of uh, banquo that is carried out not in the openness of daylight but in the darkness and it is carried out by secret agents murderers isn't it even when he kills macduff and macduff's wife uh, even then you see he does exactly the same thing once again this is a gesture not to reassert the authority of the government the authority of the king and the state but rather to get rid of certain people he thinks are inimical inimical to his own personal interests so you see in macbeth you have this contrast the contrast between legitimate power and violence and illegitimate power and violence macbeth falls in the second category he simply cannot doesn't have the ability to transcend his personal emotions feelings status in order to become the king of scotland and this is something which is you see very ironically true why <clears throat> uh michel foucault at one point this is in discipline and punish talks about something significant he says that if you think of the coronation of a king once again the coronation of a king is a public spectacle okay i mean in a democratic societies the coronation of a king is like taking the ritual of you know taking the oath in parliament isn't it once again it's a public spectacle and there are certain rituals which are associated with that fuko is saying that if you look at if you look at it from this perspective uh, the coronation of the king has an inverted double has an inverted parallel has a parodic reflection in the killing of a condemned prisoner because you see when a condemned prisoner was killed in those days the condemned prisoner was carried through the open streets on a open cart and people could see him people could spit at him people could throw things at him if they wanted to and then the condemned prisoner would be taken to the gallows where he would be hung and there would be a priest waiting to receive him and then the condemned prisoner would be forced to walk up the steps of the gallows of the gallows to mount the gallows and then he would have the noose put around his neck and then finally he would be hanged and there would be a crowd of people watching this execution now if you think of the king's coronation it is much the same thing according to fugo why because you see like the condemned prisoner who is taken to the gallows in an open carriage the king on the eve of his coronation also sits on an open carriage and the carriage is passing it passes through the street through the streets on both sides of the streets there are people looking at the spectacle of the king going to the coronation and then in the cathedral the king mounts up the steps you know once again look at the parallel in the gallows the condemned man walks up the steps to the gallows in the coronation ceremony the king walks up the steps of the cathedral to the uh, to the seat the throne on which he is going to sit before the crown is placed on his head once again notice the parallels the crown is being placed on the king's head and the rope the noose is being placed around the condemned man's uh, throat in the cathedral there is a bishop or an archbishop in the condemned prisoner there is a priest who is going to say the last few words 
so you see actually the whole ritual of coronation is a kind of a negative is a kind of a positive uh, spin on the ritual of condemnation and i think this is something which is also related to what this play macbeth is all about why because think of it first of all think of the uh, 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 of the banquet scene in the banquet scene what happens well the banquet scene itself is you know a scene in which everyone all the invited people have to come in order to show their allegiance to the new king so you see this is a kind of a pub public ritual a ritual in which everyone comes and acknowledges the power the authority of the new king and in macbeth's case what happens once again you see it turns into a travesty a parody of an actual event of an actual ritual why because an actual ritual is an act of order isn't it everything takes place step by step one after the other in Mac in in macbeth's case however in the banquet scene however there is no order there is only disorder in fact if at the end if you remember lady macbeth tells everybody please go out. please go quickly okay don't bother about your about about your positions just leave quickly so in other words you see not order but disorder the reason is once again the same that is macbeth is a kind of a inverted image of a true king a true king is an individual who does his actions out in the open and the openness of his actions really reflect on his power really reflect on his authority in macbeth's case his actions are not done in the open they're done secretly and therefore my 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 conclusion my observation will be that will be that macbeth is a kind of a imitation a travesty a parody of a real king and this it is this that this play is actually talking about it's talking about power it is talking about uh, it's talking about authority it's talking about what is right authority what is wrong authority now i said you see the notion of uh, the king's two bodies was a construct of the german uh, historian canterwitz but is it only that you know is it only canterwitz who had talked about these things not really for example you see if you look at the own of our own indian tradition we have a long history of such speculation and it is this that i want to look at very briefly now first of all uh uh yeah uh uh yes this is koti okay koti is saying the symbol of the state was the standard of sovereignty to rally loyalty and to hold the realm together he was in the words of sukra the root of the tree of the state and he continues sukra says a uh, king is the root of the tree of the state the ministry is its trunk the military chiefs and branches the army are the leaves of the tree and the subjects are its flowers prosperity of the country its fruit and the whole country the final seed uh, uh, you know this is typical of the indian notion of kingship of rulers for instance you see you can see this also in se in several places for example uh, 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 there's this book called hindu polity by a man called jaiswal here uh, jaiswal is writing the laws administration is the real king it is the ruling authority and he calls it danda that is the executive authority in polity it is the surety for the population and he continues uh, and he quotes the manava dharma shastra and he says the king who properly employs it prospers but if he be selfish abnormal and deceitful danda destroys him danda is a great luster it cannot be held by despots it strikes down the king who swerves from him and from law together with his relatives and then 
Only a king who is honest and true to his coronation oath and follows the Shastras and rules with colleagues, his ministers would wield the danda, not one who is despotic, greedy, stupid, and who rules personally. Now look at these. These words were written <coughs> uh, several hundreds of years before Shakespeare's Macbeth was written. And yet you see, look at these words once again. Only a king who is honest and true to his, to his coronation oath and follows the Shastras and rules with colleagues, the ministers, who wield the danda, not one who is des despotic, greedy, stupid, who rules personally. Now, aren't they reflective of Macbeth? Because this is exactly what Macbeth does. Macbeth is a despot. He is greedy. In a sense, he is stupid. And he rules personally, never as a state. Uh, if you look at the white, Jajur Veda, for example, uh, this is in Griffith's translation. Uh, it is being said, the state to thee is given. Thee meaning the king. The state to the king is given. Thou art the director, regulator, firm bearer of this responsibility for the, go for the good of agriculture, for well-being, for prosperity, for the growth of the people, that is, for success. And uh, the quotation continues, this is thy sovereignty. Thou art the ruler. Thou art controller. Thou art firm and steadfast. Thee for land and culture. Thee for peace and quiet. Thee for wealth. Thee for increase of our substance. These are the qualities of the good king according to our own Indian Sanskritic tradition. This is what the king should be thinking of. Not of himself, but of his subjects. Not about his own personal ambitions and reads and likes and dislikes, but about what is important for his country, for his state, for his people. Uh, 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 for example, if you look at Kautilla, the author Shastra, uh, Kautilla is saying, the symbol of the state uh, is the king, and he is the standard of sovereignty to rally loyalty, to hold the realm together. He is, the, he is in the words of Sukhra, as I said, the root of the tree of the state. Now, you see, with this defined position, the king's position is that of a servant of the state. And uh, our Indian forefathers put, put this very clearly. He said that the king is really like a grudging slave, a dasya. Uh, and uh, if you look at our epics, there you see uh, it is said that the king has to sink his individuality into his office. And uh, a king, Kautilla says, has no personal likes. It is the likes of the subject that should be followed by him. Now, once again, you see, what I'm trying to say is that in the Indian political thought of your, there is a whole notion of what a worthy king should be. A worthy king should never think of himself. A worthy king should always think of himself as subject to the will of his people, as being responsible for the good of his people. Now, uh, there's a story in the Jataka tradition. In the Jataka tradition, for example, you know, uh, there is a story in which a, a, a king's beautiful queen is asking for absolute mastery over the king's subjects. And the king replies in, the, in these words. The king says, My good lady, to me the inhabitants of, of the whole realm are no bodies. I am not their master. That is, they are their own masters. I am master only of those who offend against the ruler's laws and do what is unlawful. For this reason, I am unable to give you mastery and rule over the whole realm. Now, I think that this Jataka story has got a acute uh, uh, resonance to the story of Macbeth. Now, why did Duncan kill Macbeth? Uh, sorry, why did Macbeth kill Duncan? The reason is, of course, Lady Macbeth. Because, you know, it was an overpleaning ambition that caused Macbeth to take a step in this direction. So, you see, once again, if you remember, there's a section in which 
Macbeth is vacillating, is thinking whether he should murder Duncan or not. And Lady Macbeth says, who dares say otherwise? In other words, he, she says that when you are king, when we, what we will say is the law. There's no law above that. Once again, this is a travesty. This is a kind of a change, a kind of a misrepresentation of the whole notion of kingship. And my point is that uh, 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 in Macbeth, you find Shakespeare reflecting on just this, the failure of a king in order to become a, a king, the failure of an individual to really take on the responsibility of kingship. And this whole script, this whole idea is being represented through power and authority. The idea is that Macbeth can never think of himself as the king or the representative of the people of Scotland. You know, at a later section of the play, there is a section in which the, noble, the nobles are talking about lamenting the lack of personal uh, liberty. In every household, Macbeth has put a spy. So you see, under Macbeth, Scotland is a police state. Under Macbeth, there is no rule of law. There is only the rule of the despot, the rule of the man who has become king, not in order to literally look after the welfare of his people, but for his personal aggrandizement, for his personal self-respect. You see, what I am indicating is that after he is crowned, even after he is crowned, Macbeth fails to reconcile or fuse the two bodies of the king. The personal always remains at the locus, at the center of his concerns. And in this, even before the close of the play, Macbeth is threateningly overshadowed by Malcolm, who represents his willingness to subordinate and submerge his personal self in the larger interest and entity that is the body politic of the state. So you see, the individual body of the king which should be subordinated to the body politic of the state, this is something Malcolm is willing to do, not Macbeth. For instance, you see, <clears throat> if you remember, this is what Malcolm says, what I am truly is thine, and my poor country's to command. What I am truly is thine, and my poor country's to command. Now, this is a surrender of the self to the larger interest of the body politic of the state. Isn't it? And this shows that Malcolm will be a real king, unlike Macbeth, who was only a king in name and nothing else. <coughs> so you see, at the end of the play, the public display of Macbeth's severed head you know, his head cut off and displayed on a pole, signal, signals not barbarity, but legitimacy scripted in openness. Once again, if you remember, MacDonald's head had been cut off and shown on the ramparts. At the end of the play, Macbeth's head is being displayed in a similar fashion. And you see, this, these are public displays of not barbarity, but legitimacy scripted in openness. And this I'm saying is the very antithesis of Macbeth's de de uh, deeds of illegitimacy, which are encrypted in concealment. So I would say that one very real aspect of Macbeth's failure, his tragedy essentially, is his incapacity to ascend or to attain the status of a king. Now, status is the important word here. Because you see, status doesn't mean only having territorial rights over an estate of Scotland. Status means the position, the responsibility, the, the, the personality transforming, changing, altering, elevation of the individual to a 
condition of existence in which the individual becomes unimportant and the individual becomes part of the welfare of the kingdom. So you see, Macbeth, by killing Duncan, can gain the territorial rights over the estate of Scotland. But you see, at the end, he is like a bear tied to a stake. That is, he himself becomes the physical site of violence. And that is, you see, why I think uh, Macbeth ultimately represents what Foucault describes as the condemned man, the symmetrically inverted image of the king. And I am indicating, I am suggesting that the whole play Macbeth is a political play because it is a play about, as I said, the legitimate use of violence versus the illegitimate use of violence by a man who is king, king not only in name, but king in position, a man who is no longer an individual, but rather a representative, and not only a representative, but rather a part of the body politic. And on the other hand, Macbeth's tragedy is of a man who feels to make this transition to a higher realization. The point is that, you see, in Macbeth, what you find is that you have uh, a complete disjunction between uh, 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 the notion of an ideal king and what Macbeth can become. Now, at the end, I'll talk about uh, Kautelya in the Orthoshastra. He has the Sabdanga theory of the state or the theory of the seven elements of the state. What are these? He talks about the king, the ministers, the kingdom, uh, the, the kingdom, force, treasury, the punitive system, and allies as the individual elements. Look at these once again. First of all, the king. Number two, ministers. Number three, kingdom. Number four, force. Number five, treasury. Number six, the punitive system or the judiciary. And finally, the allies of the king. These are the seven individual elements of the state. And uh, here, uh, and then he talks about uh, these elements, he, ref he refers to uh, the double body of the king fused into one. Raja, Rajyam, Hiti, Prakiti. Now, in other words, you see, the whole concept of the state is something that uh, uh, Kautelya says is a combination of these seven elements. And you see, quite interestingly, Macbeth at the end, when he's holed up in his castle, he says that he will not have any of these things. He doesn't talk about them directly, but he talks about them indirectly. For example, he, he is the king, but he doesn't have supporters, he doesn't have friends, he doesn't have force, he doesn't have treasury, he doesn't have a punitive system, and he has no allies. So you see, at the end of the play, or towards the end of the play, Macbeth is bereft. He is never, ever capable of becoming a king. And uh, 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 here you see, my point is, whether you see Macbeth as a play from the point of view of the Western theorists, Max Weber, Kantorowicz, Foucault, whoever, you will notice that these ideas that these theorists have used can be replicated or have a parallel in our own Indian systems of thought. And these can be used alternatively or together in order to understand this great play, Macbeth. Because Macbeth may be a tragedy of an individual hero. Macbeth can also be a play about violence and authority. It can also be a play about the politics of power. Who uses power, when to use power, how to use power, and when the use of power becomes legitimate, and when does it become illegitimate. These are the issues that Shakespeare is looking at. And as Professor uh, Pranuti Chakravarti said at the beginning, it's very important because, you see, that is why Shakespeare is still relevant to us. When we read Shakespeare today in the 21st century, in this changing world order of today, 
where you see there's violence, there's confrontation, when there's misunderstanding, when there is so much tension, Shakespeare can give us the keys by which we can understand our reality in a better way. That is why we read Shakespeare even 400 so many years, 500 years after his birth. And that is why you see Shakespeare continues to be relevant to a society like India in which we are on the cusp of a great transformation. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. But before that, uh, may I say that, uh, may I end on a very personal note? The personal note is, you see, this lecture, in a sense, I intend as a tribute to my guru and my friend, Professor Amitabha Roy, who passed away last uh, Friday in the afternoon. Professor Roy was the president of the Shakespeare Society of Eastern India, and he has left us bereft. And so you see, this is a lecture which I would like to <coughs> offer in, in, as a token of remembrance, as in a token of thanksgiving for all that he has taught me over the years. Thank you. Any questions? If we have, sir is there uh, to resolve the queries or any relevant questions? So the platform is open. I think, sir, everybody is quite con content over the way in which you have explained. So I think. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are yes, audible. audible. Yes, good morning, and thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, my question to you, sir, is uh, you talked about, and I quote, the person always remains the locus of his concern. And you were talking about uh, Macbeth and how he could not fuse the two bodies of the king. Uh, but what about a play like King Lear? which uh, in which the uh, the king failed to do so and you see the result but uh, the play is named king lear so can you please elaborate on this you know i well, first of all you see king lear is a very interesting play the reason is if you really think of it uh, you know even in his madness king lear is still a king isn't he? Look at the way people address him. You know, he's mad, right? Uh, he's got, you know, no crown, but a crown of wild flowers on his head. He doesn't have royal robes. He has torn clothes on his body. And yet, you see, people address him as king. So, you see, in a sense, King Lear never ceases to become a king. In King Lear, you see, the two bodies are not so separate. Yes, King Lear does make a mistake when he gives up his uh, uh, king kingdom and he divides it amongst his two uh, daughters, his uh, elder daughters. But at the same time, you see, the tragedy of King Lear is simply this, that here is this man, four score and above, over 80 years old, a man who is never a king and yet a king for all that. You see, one of the hubrises of King Lear is, of course, when King Lear says, I have taken too little notice of this. That is, he said, when I was a king, if you remember, this is the storm scene, right? Just before he tears off his clothes. He says, you know, he has never taken care, notice of the suffering of the poor people in his kingdom. And that is a moment of awareness, a moment of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, insight, where King Lear understands that this is something that he had failed to do as a king. And at the same time, you see, King Lear is still always a king, because other people acknowledge him as king. And this element is very important, because you see, the whole point is that it is not how or what you are, it is how people publicly perceive you as king or not as king. In Macbeth's case, 
Macbeth is a dead is a is a dead butcher, and is fiend like queen if you remember. Okay, so once again you see Macbeth is not a king at all; he is rather a butcher. On the other hand, with King Lear, even at his lowest, he is always being acknowledged as king. You know, think of the situation in which Kent comes to him. Okay, Kent is in disguise. King Lear is powerless. and yet can says that there is something in your voice that you know responds in my heart that is authority now this authority is something which is i think true to king lear and king lear has it till the end in macbeth there is a marked absence of that i hope that answers your question yes perfectly thank you sir Anybody else? Ah, uh, this Ashwini Indurkar, ma'am. Basically, she just wanted to know, sir. You have mentioned certain uh, names of the books. Just, she wanted to repeat those names. Sure. Okay. First of all, well, I've re I've referred to a range of books. <laughs> In fact, maybe uh, quite a number. Okay. First of all, the Western theorists. Ah, uh, this is a man called Kantorowitz. How do you spell it? K A N T O. R I W I T Z Ernst Kantorowitz E R N S T Kantorowitz and the book is a very fat book incidentally 500 pages long over 500 500 pages long this book is called the king's two bodies is a fascinating book it's all the more fascinating because you see in this book there are about 10 12 pages that uh, Kantorowitz devotes to a discussion of Shakespeare's uh, uh, play uh, 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 Richard the 2nd Okay, now it's fascinating because you see, if you read those ten pages, it's a marvelous take on once again the two bodies thesis and how that fits in with Shakespeare's Richard the Second. Okay, now so one Cantorowitz, number two, the two books of Foucault naturally, uh, number one History of Sexuality Volume One, and number two Discipline and Punish. Okay. from the indian side i talked about a number of books for example i talked about kautilya's orthoshastra uh, there are several translations well uh, uh, i read it in translation and so you know there are several translations uh, including one by kele k e l e e very good next there was k p jaiswal k p jaiswal's book is called hindu polity hindu p o l i t y colon A constitutional history of India, a constitutional history of India in Hindu times. In Hindu times, this is 1954. Published 1954. Okay. Then I also talked about uh, well, for example, the Mahabharata, the Shanti Parva. Okay. Uh, 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 in which it is said, uh, and this is Bhishma. Okay, who's saying this? Uh, Vishwa is, of course, a representative of Hindu royalty in the in 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 the Hindu tradition, and Vishwa is saying, of all the dharmas, that is the duties of rulership, the highest is in society, is that of the of kingship. So uh, I also talked about <coughs> Kautilya's Ortho Shastra, as I said, and the quotation I gave was from Book One. Chapter nineteen, book one, chapter nineteen. What else? Well, I also talked about yeah, mm, yeah. Uh, R. T. H. Griffiths translation. R. T. H. Griffiths translation of the White Jajur Veda. Okay, uh, where it is said. Uh, and I quote: "The state is given to thee. Thou art the director, regulator, firm bearer of this responsibility, for the good of agriculture, for well-being, for prosperity, for growth of the people. That is for success." Now, once again, you see the idea of kingship there also. Okay, so these are some of the sources that I referred to, and some of the texts. That I referred to. 
Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, there is one more Priyanka Singh, ma'am. She has raised her hand. So, yes, good Priyanka, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah you are absolutely. Okay, so my question is a more generalized one. Uh, we see that, you know, uh, critics and scholars, they keep on taking Shakespeare over other Elizabethan dramatists. So what is it that makes him so approachable even now, whereas other Elizabethan uh, dramatists are ignored? Uh, they were also talking about the themes that, you know, Shakespeare talks about. Then what is it about Shakespeare that people still go for Shakespeare? Is it just the name and the glory that is attached to the name or is it more than that? Okay, uh, you know, there are several answers to that question. The first answer is, of course, that, you know, uh, Shakespeare was a genius. The others were, if not, if shades of genius, but not true genius. The reason is, you see, there's so much in Shakespeare that resonates across the centuries. Because you see, uh, uh, you know, you can look at Shakespeare, not from the point of view only of the Elizabethan age, but, okay, let me give you some basic ideas. First of all, you know, if you think of uh, uh, Henry the Fifth, Henry the Fourth, part two, okay? Now, at the end of the play, Henry the Fourth is dying. His son, Prince Hal, who's going to become Henry the Fifth, is sitting by the bedside of his dying father and uh, Hal picks up the crown and he muses upon the crown and he wonders what is the responsibility of the crown that is going to come to him and he walks out of the room. Just at that moment, King Henry V, dying King Henry V wakes up and he sees that the crown is missing. Okay, And then his son comes in and he chides his son, admonishes his son and says, you can't wait till I die before you try out my crown. Okay. And then he gives some very sound advice to his son about how to rule a kingdom. What is this advice? One piece of advice is very relevant. And that is, you see, uh, he is saying that when you become king, if you think that there is some problem in your kingdom, that people are not listening to you, that, pe that your power is waning, what you should do is to start a war somewhere else. Why? Because if you start a war, then your popularity is automatically going to increase. Now, you see, this is something that all rulers know. Think of George Bush. His popularity is going, was going down. So what did you do? He started the Gulf War. And once again, you see, his popularity soared. Okay? Now, this happens over and over. In our country, too, you have the same uh, same scenario. A, a prime minister starting a war somewhere. Why? Once again, to boost popularity. Okay, why? I'll give you another, another example. You know, many, many years back, when I was a very young lecturer in the university, and as you know, when you join a new university and you're very young, you're given the worst classes. Okay? In my case, you see, I was given a class, <coughs> a very weak class. These were fine art students, performing art students, you know, students doing music, drama, and, you know, all kinds of uh, 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 and songs and so and so as in the graduate courses. And I was to, I was, I was to teach them uh, 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 the play was Julius Caesar. The time is also very significant. This was in the very early 80s. and. If you remember, 1977 was the age of the emergency in India, when the state had the power of imprisoning anybody it wanted to under its draconian uh, authority. And you see, uh, after 1977, what happened was that Indira Gandhi was overthrown in the elections. A new party called the Janta Party came to power, which ruled before it disintegrated two or three years later. Now, I was teaching this play, Julius Caesar, a few years after this. And, you know, as I was teaching this play, it somehow struck me, it suddenly struck me that this is a play which Shakespeare wrote over 400 years back, but that's not true. Because you see, this is a play which is talking to me right now. For example, if you think of uh, Julius Caesar, who are the main characters? Obviously, there is Cassius, okay, the main plotter, if you want. There is Brutus, 
the idealistic face, the idealistic hero, the idealistic, let's say, uh, image of the anti uh, 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 Caesar uh, rebellion, revolution. There are people like Casca, okay, cynical, right? -o? And there are a whole lot of other people below that. Now, it struck me that you see, after the emergency, this is exactly what had happened. The Prime Minister was a very, uh, well, first of all, uh, there was a Brutus figure in our own country. That was Jay Prakash Narayan, idealist, uh, visionary, very Brutus like figure. There was a political figure, Muraji Desai, once again, very comparable in a sense to Cassius. There were people, for example, uh, a kind of a, 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 a person who was uh, most often comic, more comic than not, a man called George Fernandez. And so you see, these were once again the Shakespeare prototypes that were being played out over and over again. And once again, you see, the democracy of the Janta Party came to an end because the internal squabbles did put an end to it. Just as the same thing happened in the politics of India at that point. So you see, these are the visions that you find in Shakespeare. These are the messages that you find in Shakespeare. These are messages which are, you know, there for all times. Or I'll give you a third example. The third example is one of a, a Polish uh, production. Not The production was not Polish. It was a British Council production of uh, Richard II, okay, in Poland. This was after the Prague Spring. The Prague Spring, if you remember, was a resurrection, an uprising by the Polish people against Soviet Union rule, against Soviet rule. And the British Council team had gone to Poland to do this play, and they were performing in a very small auditorium. And you know, it was in English. And so the actor who was performing in the role of the king, uh, he, there's a scene in which he kneels down on the ground, that is on the stage, he takes off his glove from his right hand, he's in armor, okay, he takes off the armored glove from his right hand, and he touches the floor, and he talks about the sweets of England, he talks about the ground of England. You know, the actor later wrote that when he was doing this, he was wondering if anyone would understand what he was talking about. Because first of all, he thought English is an alien language to these people. And then he said that as I was doing that scene, I heard a sound which I had never heard before in my life. What was the noise? The noise in the audience was a curious, splashing kind of a noise. And then he realized that, you know, the people in the auditorium, all of them, hundreds of them, they were crying. Why? Because as he was touching the ground of the stage and as he was talking about England and about how England is being lost, the people in the audience who had just, you know, seen the defeat of the revolution against the Soviet government were seeing exactly the same thing. Their country being humiliated, their country being totally under the rule of the Soviet people. So you see, the defeat of their country was something that was reflecting in their minds when they saw this British actor performing in the role of the, of the king, lamenting the death of England. So you see, these are issues which are not only universal, these are issues which are typical of all times, which is why we turn to Shakespeare. If you think of the other dramatists of the period, however great they are, if you think of people, say, at the same time, contemporary, say, Ben Jonson, or if you think of people a little later, say, <coughs> Webster, or Turner, or Marston, none of these people, none of these playwrights have the same dynamics of imagination. None of these people have the power of resonating in the minds of countless generations of human individuals the world over. Which is why, you see, Shakespeare is Shakespeare. He has everything. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, can we say, sir, that it, it is the adaptability of Shakespeare's vision which makes him Shakespeare? I mean, be it Poland or India or any part of the world, you can adapt his vision and uh, there is a new toy with the same old structure. Well, first of all, you see, I think the structure is uh, important, yes, but not all important. The reason is, you see, it is the themes which are important. Yeah. Okay. For example, you know, uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I give an indication of this, you see, if you think of the notion of nationalism, okay, 
nationalism is in, in India is something which had its beginnings in Shakespeare in the 19th century, right? Because you see, before that, there was no notion of nationalism. But during the free freedom struggle, one of the predominant thinkers who influenced the Indian consciousness was Shakespeare, which is why everybody, Rabindranath Tagore, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay, everyone talks in superlative terms of William Shakespeare. So you see, they learned from Shakespeare. They learned how to express themselves, how learned how to formulate their ideas. They learned how to communicate their emotions and passions through the language of Shakespeare. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I think uh, um, Ashwini Indurkar, ma'am, yes. Uh, there was a follow-up question uh, to the discussion about King Lear, where uh, uh, it was about that uh, King Lear was always king. But can we say that sometimes he was too much of a king that he forgot a father and thus the tragedy? Well, once again, you see, this is an important question, yes, because you see, uh, uh, the whole point is, you see, at one point, I mean, can you split off the personal from the public? Can you split yeah. the father from the king? Not really. If you become too much of a father, will you be less of a king? Or if you're too much of a king, will be less a father? And if you think of it, one of the flaws of King Lear is that he does not, you know, one of the flaws of King Lear is that he loves his youngest daughter too much. You know, when he is distributing his kingship, okay, what does he say? He says, the best part I have kept for my youngest daughter. Yeah. Okay. Now, you see, if he's done that, then the whole rigmarole about, you know, me dividing my kingdom depending on how much you love me about uh, how much uh, on your declarations of how much you love me okay so that wasn't a test at all was it it's, it was Where? a test in which you see the result was already there in king lear's mind that he's going to oh, give the best what? part of his kingdom yes sorry yeah, yeah it was i mean he already had decided uh whom he's going to give the land but then i don't know maybe he wanted to show it to the people of the kingdom yeah, that's, that's, that's just the point I'm trying to make. You see, the whole thing is the whole love competition business. Okay, yeah. so you tell me how much you love me. So if you love okay. me very much, I'll give you gold. If you love me less, I'll give you less. Okay, so th that, was a, that was a facade. That was a show. Isn't it? He's already made up his mind about what he's going to give to his different daughters. Okay, and he said the best part I've kept in mind for you. Yeah. Okay, which is why, you know, he's all the more shocked when she says nothing. Yeah. Isn't it? So King Lear was too much of a father, too less of a king. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Though I'm having some trouble uh, taking that statement, but I'll think more about it because it does not Do. seem so. Maybe I'll have to read it again. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, just look at those sections, you, you see. Uh, in the trial, in the in in, in the uh, love contest scene, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. And you know, King Lear says very clearly, "For you, I've kept the best." Now, if he's kept the best for Cordelia, okay, then the whole business of you know, uh, uh, this is a competition, etc., open competition, etc., that doesn't stand, does it? Then what was the need? Sorry. What was the need, the quantifying of love and all the show business? Uh, was it for the image of father or the image of king? It was for the image of the king. Then you, see, the, the, you see, the point of the image of the king is that you have to show that you are impartial. Okay. Isn't it? Okay. The public image, you see. Clear. Like politicians have a public image, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and they can't go out of that public image, even if they want to. Well, yeah. Okay, only King Lear's calculations are yeah. all upset. 
because of the recalcitrance of Cordelia. Because Cordelia fails to live up to the promise that King Lear had seen in her. Yes. Okay, sir, I, I got you. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're welcome. So I think uh, Ashwini Indukar ma'am and Priyanka Singh ma'am must have been satisfied with the way sir had answered to your queries. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Ashwini Indukar ma'am, I hope like things are being resolved from your end. Any other questions to be yes, have? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you ma'am. Thank you sir. Okay then. So now... Uh, with this, like, I would like to extend uh, a big thank you to respected Dr. Subir Dhar, sir, for providing such a deep insights into the topic and also revealing some of the most in interesting facts, too. So it was truly amazing to hear you, sir. With this, we have reached the last step of today's session, and I would like to end it up with a formal gratitude course. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. I take this prestigious opportunity to express my deep sense of gratitude to the very resourceful personality, Dr. Subir Dharsa, for the wonderful uh, stimulate uh, for the for, for wonderfully stimulating with his address that opened up the new annals to redefine the new ways in which Shakespearean studies that is timeless and it is totally universal. So a big thank you to you, sir. I further extend my heartfelt thanks to the mentor and the source of our inspiration, respected Dr. Pranoti Chakraborty, ma'am, for gracing this occasion and delivering the phenomenal introductory remarks for today's session. A dream doesn't become reality through magic, and it takes sweat, determination, and hard work. Yes, it is a brief endorse to the generous personality, Dr. Usha Sakure, ma'am, for, uh, uh, for her constant support, being the backbone to make this program splendid and successful. My special thanks to Dr. Prashant Shelke, sir, all the distinguished academicians from English fraternity and all the members of Shakespearean Society for their constant support and motivation. Without a disciplined and extremely engaged audience, this session cannot be successful. So my special thanks to such a diverse and dynamic participants for their active participation in large number. Uh, every next level of your life will demand a different version of you. So bringing up with a new version within the agenda of Shakespearean certificate course tomorrow with an eminent resource person, Dr. Sripad Bhatt, Adjunct Professor, MAHE Manipal University, Manipal, who would deliver his scholarly discourse on the exclusive topic, Shakespeare's criticism, tomorrow at the same time, that is 10 a.m. on the same platform. So with this, we come to an end to our program, and um, I hereby declare the end of today's program. Stay happy and stay healthy. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.